Last summer, I took a trip to Phoenix with my whole family. It was the first time I'd been there in a while. My, my side of the family lives in Arizona, so it was the first chance for a lot of my family members to get to meet our kids, and it was a fun trip. My wife was far too pregnant to take her in the middle of summer to the desert. It was not great timing on my part, and I'm sorry, my love. When we came back, we were going through the whole airport thing. My parents booked the flights, and so they wanted to squeeze like all the family time in as they could, so they booked us like a late flight, and we get back at like 9.30 or 10 or something ridiculously like that for toddlers, and uh, we had just all kinds of luggage, car seats and strollers and bags and all this stuff, and we're there late at the terminal at the baggage claim, obviously struggling with this massive amount of luggage, and this awesome guy comes up with like this humongous cart and says, hey man, you need some help? I was like, oh yes, that would be terrific. You are the best. Thank you so much, sir. And then uh, about halfway to the car, this guy's gone like out of the way. He like helped us find the strollers that wasn't coming down on the carousel. He helped us find the, the bags and get it all loaded up on this car. About halfway to the car, I realize, I think I'm supposed to tip this guy. And I lean over to Brandy really fast and say, do you have any cash? And she said, I got like two bucks, which was $2 more than I had. <laughs> so we get everything unloaded at the car. Uh, I do the whole thing where I put the money in my hand and I try to shake his hand like really sly-like and be like, thanks, man. You were awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm sure he walked away and looked at his hand and said, what in the world did this joker just give me? $2? This is ridiculous. I want you guys to turn to the people around you, talk, it's okay to talk in church, uh, answer this question. What's the worst tip you've ever given or received? Go ahead, talk amongst yourselves. We'll give you a minute. I'll, I'll choose not to go into my whole Adam ruins everything spiel about how tipping is terrible and we shouldn't have to and Americans should just get paid a regular wage. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, good morning and welcome to Wildwood Christian Church. My name is Elliot. I'm the student minister here. And I'm so, so thankful that you guys are here, whether this is your first, second, third time, or if you've been here like a bajillion times before since you were a baby, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you've chosen to spend time with us and to, uh, to worship God with us. I was really excited when Doug, our senior pastor, asked me to, to preach this week uh, because the series is called Baggage. And I don't know about you, but I have some baggage. Maybe not necessarily in a bad way, but I'd like to show you guys. I was working all week to try and figure out all the cool things that I could share with you guys and show you. And I am really excited to show you guys some of the things from my life that I'm pretty proud of. Some of the things I've done, I've accomplished. Let me see here. This is Tux. And a lot of you guys don't know, but some of you do, that Tux is the mascot of Linux, a free and open source operating system. Well, free as long as you don't count your time worth anything. It is a free software project, and it is like my favorite thing. I love Linux. I fell in love with Linux in college, and I love it so much that I somehow convinced my wife to almost name our daughter after Linux. This represents sort of like the technology skills that I have, the aptitude that I have for server management and software development and stuff. I'm nowhere near a genius, but I'm pretty good at it. I'm pretty proud of my accomplishments that I've made in terms of technology. Another thing I'm pretty proud of, I was an engineering student once. Bet you didn't know that. I was a, uh, in drafting classes for all of high school, and I did an internship at a company kind of like Boeing my senior year. And during that senior year, I, uh, I took first place in a statewide competition in Arizona, and then I took 11th place nationally, and I was really proud of myself. 11th place, not, I didn't, if I were 10th, I would have gotten like on the honorable mention role, but I was, missed it by that much. But I was very technically and math oriented. And even today, if I'm like sketching out something like as simple and stupid as like a, a graphic for a sermon or something like that, I still like dimension everything and I go like way over the top and my engineer friends know what I'm talking about. I cannot not do that. But 
I'm pretty proud of the accomplishments I've made in terms of that. Some of you guys, most of you guys probably know this, but I was in ROTC in high school for three years. In my senior year, junior year rather, third year, I was the armed drill team commander. They even, they even gave me, look at this, they even gave me a trophy because I was so awesome at it. Whoa! Should have practiced that more. I was an armed drill team commander, and I, I didn't really, I don't really fit the bill nowadays, but back in the day, I was a pretty good soldier, sailor, as it were. I even hit, still have some of my moves. They're not all there. The ones that are might be just a little bit rusty, but it's kind of like riding a bicycle. Now, why do I bring these up? Is it just to brag on all the cool things I've done and all the stuff that I've accomplished? Well, that's like a nice side effect, but that's not really the main point. At some point along the way, I looked at these things and they added value to me as a person. In my head, they made me more valuable, more hireable, maybe. They made me a better person in one way or the other. And I'm willing to bet that each of us in here have something now that makes you feel like more accomplished, like you're a better person, like you're more hireable, something that gives you higher status in your own mind. And we don't just do this with our skills, our talents, our, our abilities, our obsessions, some of us. We do this in our spiritual life all the time. I've got this stack of torn up Bibles that I'm pretty proud of. I keep with me going all the way back to like fourth or fifth grade or something like that, including my daily driver, as it were, now. They're torn up, and when I look at those, I think to myself, man, I must have read those enough. I must have read those and drawn closer to Jesus. I must have done something that Jesus was pretty proud of. And I even was so in love with that whole Bible thing that I went to Bible college, and I worked there. And I even, they gave me an award, Servant's Heart Award. That's, you know, because I'm so humble. And nowadays, I even work at a church and have business cards to prove it. Catch. <laughs> Nailed it. I've got these things, these accomplishments, this stuff in my life that's baggage. And it weighs me down when I look at these things, and I start to think that I have things figured out. I start to think that I'm accomplishing something. I start to think that I'm something pretty special. And the danger that I fall into time and time again is that I'll look at these things, this stuff, this baggage, and I'll say, that's what makes me a valuable person in the eyes of God. That is what makes me righteous, and that is what makes me faithful to him. Nothing that Jesus did, it's, it's all the things that I did. And I bet that some of you guys have been there too. The Apostle Paul was there. If, you go, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and pull them out. If you have your own, you get five Jesus points today. And if you open it with me, you get an additional ten. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3. And if you're using one of the brown Bibles in the seat under, underneath the seat in front of you, it'll be page 952. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 12. But while you're getting there, I want to sort of give you some history about what's been going on in this letter so far. This is a letter written by a guy named Paul, who was kind of a big deal back in the day of the, uh, the early Christian church. He was uh, pretty commonly, he would go on church planning missions, and he would write back letters to sort of fix stuff. So he was sort of like the, I envision like the drill sergeant kind of guy. Like, hey man, you're messing up here, you better fix it, you better cut that out, you better knock it off. But in this letter, the tone is really different. He's really emotional and sort of weepy and just sort of all around flowery. And we figure out why in the letter he's in prison, probably in Rome. Really smart guys with PhDs argue about where he was in prison, but that doesn't really matter at the end of the day. He was in prison. And he was expecting that one of two things was going to come of it. He was going to be killed, or he was going to be released. And he was pretty happy with either outcome. He was in prison, and he was sort of emotional. And he writes this to the church in Philippi. 
And Philippi is sort of a special church. It was the first church that Paul and his friend Silas planted in Europe. So it's the first Jesus-following community of people on the European continent. The first time that the message of Jesus and his sacrifice uh, parted out of Asia Minor and into Europe. It changed history, but that's neither here nor there. One of the things he's doing in this letter is combating some of those false teachings. Some of the stuff that, that's not really what we talked about. That's not really what Jesus was getting at when he said this. He's sort of writing to correct these misconceptions. And then in Philippians chapter 3, we'll start in verse 12. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things, or that I have already achieved or have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we already have made. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our mortal weak bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. You guys pray with me. God, we are thankful for everything. We are grateful for the way that you are working in this world, and we're grateful for the, the gift that you've given us in your grace and your mercy and your sacrifice. I pray that you would just be with us today as we, we read your word, as we dissect uh, some of the things that you've taught us, and uh, God, just help us to open our hearts, open our minds to, to you. We love you so much, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we read this whole thing. Paul's talking about forgetting the past, looking to what's ahead, and the first thing that pops into my head when I read this is, what is this past that he's talking about? What's this past that he's trying to forget? Luckily for us, he already told us. If we skip back a few verses to the beginning of chapter 3, and in verse 2, he says, Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. Underline that if you have a pen. We put no confidence in human effort. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. A real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. So Paul is laying out quite the resume here. And he doesn't just use empty words. He actually has like the credentials and the history to back it up. Let's keep reading verse 7. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count my own righteousness through obeying the law, rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. Paul's laying out sort of this shift of mind. He's changed his mind. He's changed his thinking. He used to depend on his own righteousness, depend on his own abilities and his own efforts to make himself right with God. And now he's shifted his focus all to Jesus. And he's telling his readers that they just need to forget what is in their old baggage. And there's a couple of things I want to point out about what we just read. Our old baggage isn't always bad stuff. The things that Paul lays out, the things that he says he used as his righteousness, things like being zealous to follow God, things like being born in the tribe of Benjamin, thats he can't help that, being a Pharisee, he was really devoted to following Judaism. 
That's not a bad thing. He may have taken it a little far with the whole persecuting church. That might be a little excessive. But it's not inherently bad, the things that he's talking about. Some of us are struggling with negative baggage. And we typically think of those sorts of negative events in our lives when we think of the word baggage, right? We think of some hurt or loss or disease or something that is just racking our guilt or our conscience from our past that has consequences in the present. Those are typically the things that we think of when we use the word baggage, but the baggage that Paul is talking about in this passage isn't uh, a negative thing, isn't a, isn't a past hurt or hurting someone else in the past. It's about trying to earn our righteousness. It's about trying to earn our salvation through the good things that we do and the things that we depend on and put trust in instead of in Jesus. They're not necessarily bad things. And then Paul tells us that our baggage is worth less than garbage. So he, he uses this word garbage in my New Living Translation, uh, but your translation might use the word dung or something like that. Um, th- but that doesn't quite capture the vulgarity that Paul is trying to get at here. Think of like a different four-letter word that could be for dung. I, I, I'm not allowed to say it here because I will get promptly fired by one of the many elders. That's sort of what Paul is going for here, sort of like this shock factor, like in your face, like all of the stuff, all of the good things that I've done, all the things that I think provide value and add righteousness to my life, all that stuff is garbage. Poop. Garbage. Less than garbage. And when we look at our own attempts at righteousness, our own attempts to earn our way to God, to to carry our righteousness with us. Those are less than garbage too. It doesn't matter how often I pray or how often I read my Bible. It doesn't matter how many times I do or don't lie or curse or think thoughts that I shouldn't think. It doesn't matter. Any of that self-righteousness stuff doesn't matter. It's less than garbage compared to knowing Jesus and compared to having faith in him and letting him make us righteous. Less than garbage. And so he's discounting it as loss. But he tells us that he's not there yet. Our baggage is never fully gone. It's not, it's never, we can't get rid of it altogether. Let's start again in verse 12. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Paul states repeatedly and without apology, he's not there yet. He's not arrived at this whole, I'm following Jesus and I'm putting my own actions behind. He's not there yet, and he's not going to get there. But he's making progress. Forget what you think makes you valuable to God. Forget what you think makes you righteous. Because it's not about what we do. It's not about what we don't do. It's not about our determination. It's about what Jesus has already done for us. That's what he's pressing on towards, towards knowing Christ having faith in him, and letting God give him the righteousness that we never could earn. Stop trying to earn righteousness. Stop trying to earn salvation. There's nothing we can do to make that happen. He's already done it. So forget your old baggage. Just leave it behind. Going back to the trip to Phoenix that we took, my wife and I pack very differently. I have a suspicion that a lot of married couples have discovered the same thing. Typically, if I'm packing for a trip, something like this is what I go for. And this includes like my laptop, my clothes, I don't know what else, toothbrush? I think that's about all I bring. That's my, that's what I pack. This is actually my wife's bag. I stole it from our basement. When we moved last time, I found it full of nursing books that were very heavy and surprising. This is my wife's bag. And I learned very early on that we pack very differently. 
And it's not totally fair to say today, because typically we'll get like a big bag that includes all the kids' stuff, and like a smaller bag that will have our stuff. And so it's, it's a little bit different nowadays, but I learned really early on, like on our honeymoon, that we packed very, very differently. She got like hair dryer, straightener, lotion, shampoo. Uh, I don't know what else I'm even supposed to pack. Shoes? Did you pack shoes? Yeah, shoes. I, don't know. I have one pair of shoes that I wear every day. We pack really, really differently. And I think it's because she's smarter, more prepared, thinks through things better than I do, that's for sure. We pack differently because we have different goals in mind. Paul says when he is trying to earn his own righteousness, he packs this way. He stacks up all his stuff. He keeps track of all his accomplishments, his skills, all the things that he's done right and counts those towards his own salvation, towards his righteousness. But now we're packing for this new way of following Jesus, this new way of being in Christ. And he tells us how to do that. Let's keep reading in verse... uh, We'll restart in verse 13. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you, but we must hold on to the progress we already have made. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine. Oops. And learn from those who follow our example. I want to focus on verse 13 for a second, because I really like the way the New English translation puts this. I think I got it up here. Yeah, that one. Sorry, Krishna. I am single-minded, forgetting the things that are behind and reaching out for the things that are ahead. Single-minded, I think, summarizes this really well. For us, for the Philippians, be single-minded. Focused solely and totally and completely on this one thing, forgetting the past, moving forward to what's ahead. Forgetting our own stuff, embracing fully what Jesus has already done for us. Be single-minded. And it's tough for us to do that, right? It's easy for us to, to think about and live this way because there are rules. There's cause and effect. It's simple to us because it fits and there's consistency. And it works well with our 21st century empirically driven minds. But Jesus' grace is messy and it's confusing and it's abstract and it's hard for us to understand because our whole society is built on fairness, on justice. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around grace and mercy when so much of our lives is full of cause and effect. But we have to make that decision. We have to think consistently and make that decision that we're going to forget what is in the past, forget our old baggage, and look forward to knowing Christ, to knowing just Him, and depending on His righteousness alone. First Paul says to be, what was it? Single-minded. Thank you guys. I'm glad you're here. Be single-minded. Be totally focused on this one thing. And next he says to be firm where you stand. He says, but we must hold on to the progress we have already made. It's easy to want to go back to this. It's tempting. It's familiar. We've been there before. We know how much it weighs. We've struggled through it before. It's easy to want to go back to that, back to the things that make us feel better about ourselves, that makes, make us feel prideful most of the time. I know it is for me. But Paul says, stand firm. Hold on to the progress that you've already made. We've all made some progress between forgetting the past and pressing on to the forward. Stay there. Don't fall back. Don't turn back to what once was. But look solely with a single mind on the future. 
Be firm where you stand. And then he tells them to follow his example. Follow the example that he has set and the example that others like him have set. And I wish that I were at a place in my life, in my walk with Jesus, that I could say, hey, why don't you just go ahead and, you know, follow me, imitate me, be a disciple of Elliot. But that would lead you astray. Don't do that, guys. Paul is making a pretty bold claim. Follow my example. And it's my prayer that someday I would get to the point in my life where I could be a consistent and solid example of how it is to follow Jesus. But I don't think I'm there yet, for the most part. But I have people in my life that are further along than I am. People who have made it longer, people who have made it farther and have made more progress. And I can look at them as an example of what it looks like to be a father who follows Jesus, a husband who follows Jesus, to be a pastor. I've got people in my life who inspire me. Paul is saying, be inspired by others. Look for the example of other people. Be inspired by them to draw ever closer to Jesus. I've got all these toys because I can't sit through a meeting still. And I don't know if you, you guys have probably seen all these fidget spinners that are everywhere. And like my, my friend Kevin got me one because he's awesome. But I have one of those. I have these toys. I bring them into every staff meeting or other kind of meeting I ever go to. They help me keep focused. That and a pretty hefty dose of Adderall. But they help me keep focused. Paul is saying to be focused. As we're packing our new bags, we have to remain focused on Jesus. Not on ourselves, not on our stuff. But on Jesus. I have my awesome wife over here. And I don't know what I did, but I've married up quite a bit. And I am so thankful for her. And constantly, she is the motivation for me to not fall backwards, to not go back to where I once was. So I pack her. I bring her with me. Then he says, be inspired by others. Find an example to follow. Someone who's been there, who's done that, someone who knows what they're talking about. Be inspired by others. This is my brother and his family. He's four years older than me. He's a pastor in Phoenix. And he is just all around the, my go-to guy when, I'm, have, when I need advice on life, on being a dad, on being a husband, on broken cars, because I got it from him. You guys have heard all my broken car stories. I got it from him. It's his fault, Brandy. I'm sorry. But he inspires me to be better than I am today. And he inspi- he's an example for me that I bring with me. As I'm packing my new bags, I need to stay focused, single-minded. I need to stay firm where I am, not give up an inch, not go back to that way that I was in the past. And look to the example of other people who've been there, who've done that. A lot of you know the story about how I tried to drive a Volkswagen van from Phoenix to St. Louis. So I'll spare you a lot of the details. We didn't make it very far, about halfway. But we didn't bring a map because we were, you know, three college kids who figured, you know, it's just I-40, we'll make it to Arkansas where my buddy lives, and then we can figure it out from there. It's just a straight shot up to St. Louis. It's easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So we didn't bring a map. And this was in the age before smartphones were everywhere, and we didn't have, like, any internet access in our piddly little van. So we were kind of up a creek when we got lost. And, of course, we got lost because we were three college students. We ended up spending the night on the side of the road outside of Waco, Texas, I think. Our car was broken. We couldn't get to a stop, a truck stop. It was late at night, and we didn't know where we were going, so we just sort of camped out. That was the worst night's sleep I've ever had. In a van full of luggage and other dudes. Oh, it was just awful. But because of that, I always have a map with me. I have one from when I lived in Indiana for a little while. 
I used to do quite a bit of traveling in Illinois, so I would I'd have one for that, for Missouri, and for the St. Louis area, which does not include West County. I'm kind of mad at Woundenbergs. Not happy with them. But I always keep a map because I was burned before. I was stranded. I didn't know where I was going. I always keep a map in my car so that I know where I'm going to go. Paul has talked about forgetting our old baggage, forgetting our own self-righteousness, and leaning on Jesus and his salvation, on his righteousness, packing our new bags. And then he talks about sort of this road map here. Let's read in verse 17. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak moral bodies and cha- mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. He sort of gives us two examples. First, he says to remember where we've been. These people who are, he calls, enemies of the cross of Christ. These people who live lives for themselves whatever the consequence. Live lives focused on their own pleasure, on their own desires, on the things that they want out of life and nothing else. And he says, remember that. Remember where you were. We all come to Jesus from different backgrounds. Some of us took a longer route than others. Some of us took a darker route than others. But we've all come to Jesus from some kind of background. And Paul is pointing out, remember how it was. Remember where you've been. Don't go back there. Remember what it was like when you tried to earn your way to God. Remember what it was like when you were keeping the spiritual scorecard of your value and your worth. Remember that. And don't go back. And then in verse 20, But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. He gives them a peek of what's coming, a look at where they're going, where we're going, a look at what's ahead. This is what you're striving for, faith in Christ and union with him and eternity with him. Remember that that's where you're going and push forward to make that a reality. My friend wrote a book, a commentary on the whole Bible, if it's still in here. And I really like what he says about Philippians. The word joy appears 16 times in this tiny book. Paul can scarcely get his mind it. That's not to mention words like rejoice and glad and cheered. It is this joy that sustains the Christ follower in hardship. It is what makes them stand faithfully as a witness. It is what motivates them to Christ-like humility. And it is this joy that marks the believer as unique amongst a canvas of miserable people. Everybody has baggage. You, me, the people outside this building, the people who've never heard about Jesus before. We all have baggage. What separates us and others who follow Jesus from everyone else is that we have someone who's taken that baggage for us. We have someone that said, I got this. You don't have to carry this heavy load anymore. You don't have to make it on your own. You don't have to try and pull this backpack up the mountain. I've got this covered. Jesus says, forget your old baggage. Look forward with your new bags at what's ahead. And keep an eye on where you've been, where you're going, where you are on the map. He says, forget your old baggage because I've already taken care of it. Now everyone, when you, got, when you came here today, you should have gotten this baggage tag. Go ahead and pull that out. 
we all have something in our lives that we're still putting our trust in. Paul tells the Philippians that they should put their trust in Jesus above everything else and above everyone else. But the temptation for all of us is to put our trust in ourselves, in the things that we can do, in our finances, in our job, in the things that we think make us more valuable to God and make us closer to righteous with Him. So what I want us to do in the next few minutes, a song is going to play, and I want us to spend some time thinking about what it is that is our baggage, what it is that we're trusting in, what it is that we think makes us righteous. And then this week, your homework, I bet you didn't think you were going to get homework, your homework is to take this, leave it behind, somewhere that you won't go back. Don't like litter, because that's rude and mean and stuff like that. But leave it, like in a trash can at the, parking, at the park, or at, uh, at Schnooks, or something like that. Or the Mecca of my family, Quick Trip. Leave it somewhere as a symbolic act. This is my baggage, and I'm leaving it behind. So I'm going to pray, the song is going to play, and then we'll take some time to reflect. God, you are good, you are great, and you are mighty. I thank you so much for the joy that you give us and the, the, the peace that you've given us. I thank you for taking our baggage, for taking our, our need to be righteous on our own and for getting rid of it. I'm thankful for the ways that you've worked in the past. I'm thankful for the ways that you're working in the present. And I'm thankful for the ways that you will work in the future. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.